Warning, tonight's presentation, although edited for YouTube, contains imagery and subject matter some may find disturbing. While our program is educational, we still feel that viewer discretion is advised. Take notes on gameplay and the things they do, and please take note of any bugs they may experience. Immediately stop the playtesting session if the playtester begins to show signs of a panic attack, the playtester is sick or needs a break, the playtester is experiencing a feeling of deja vu, the game crashes or locks up, the game ceases to play background music, the game begins to lag heavily for seemingly no reason, or the game displays the playtester's name. If your designated playtester requires first aid, please refer to tape 3 of this collection. ARGs are a form of storytelling that intentionally blurs the lines of what is real and what's fiction. This is done to give the player a fleeting sense they're going down a serious conspiracy that they themselves are uncovering. As players investigate and put the story together, the creator rolls out more content that pushes the narrative forward. Oftentimes, this is done to promote a product. For example, the I Love Bees ARG was commissioned by Microsoft to promote the game Halo 2. And according to Bungie, the narrative in I Love Bees is technically canon, and is referenced in the Halo graphic novel as well as the 2009 Halo Encyclopedia. Finding out what an ARG is supposed to promote is often a part of the fun, but what happens when the product placement is not apparent? When a horrific storyline becomes too real and people start thinking that there's real danger around, and act accordingly. Over the years since the inception of ARGs, many people have mistaken other things for ARGs. Even worse yet, some people bring real-world tragedy and death into their projects so that they seem more horrifying, all for the purposes of what's supposed to be a fictional game. Today, we're gonna go over what happens when that line between fiction and unfiction gets blurred too much, when creators and fans alike are no longer able to separate reality while budding egos causes a project to crash and burn. I want to take you down memory lane as we go over some of the more notable controversies, and maybe clear up a few misconceptions about the more popular ones with further research and information. But before we do that, here's a special message. So you might not know this about me, but yeah, I I'm, I'm a little autistic. And because I have autism, I have to deal with something called sensory overload, which can make being in public more stressful than it needs to be. At worst, I can even go catatonic. I soon found out, however, that my sponsor Raycon solved that issue with noise isolating tech that made it possible to walk around the mall on the opening of Black Panther Wakanda Forever without much of an issue at all. You can even turn off this mode if you feel like you need more situational awareness. Due to being low profile and having an awareness mode, you won't even need to take them out and no one needs to know that they're there unlike over-the-ear alternatives or these around-the-neck Bluetooth headphones I have. But you don't have to take my word for it. Here are the opinions of people I've interviewed in my area. I die for Raycons! I like Raycons, but don't film me. Raycons are cool. Each bud has a playtime of up to 8 hours and can be worn independently for longer, continuous playtime. When I worked at the gas station, something like this would have come in handy, especially on those big, long 16-hour shifts. The case seamlessly charges the headphones, and when it's ready to come out, it instantly connects to my phone. Swapping between my laptop and phone was also far simpler than I expected it to be, especially with the issues I've had with other Bluetooth devices at a similar price point. I can't stress this enough. Like. Uh, breaking the ad for a second. Me and my buddy unironically actually use Raycons as a daily driver when walking up to the store or going to work. After using Raycons for a whole month, I can say that it's actually probably the best birthday gift I got this year, and I want to stress that I mean that with the utmost sincerity. If anything I said sounded interesting to you, then you are looking at a perfect gift to give this holiday season. Click the link in the description or go to buy Ray 
raycon.com slash that creepy reading and use code holiday to get 15% off site wide. There will also be new pop up deals every day during Raycon's countdown to Christmas, so feel free to check back every now and again for the best offers. Using the link also seriously helps the channel because I really do like these headphones and certainly wouldn't mind testing more. As I would love to continue working with these guys because these headphones genuinely have been an improvement on my life. So with that out of the way, feel free to sit back, relax, turn down the lights, and prepare to be scared as we present some of the most controversial and unsettling ARGs in recent history. Also, we only have eight of them. The intro title graphic was wrong. I, I didn't have enough time to finish that item. R roll the title card! On April 19th of 2022, the 12th book in the series Fazbear Frights was released. Fazbear Frights is a collection of short stories surrounding the FNAF universe, and its 12th installment was intended as a bonus included with the third box set, which contained content that was cut from the other books in the series. It's unclear if these stories were cut for quality control, lore reasons, or otherwise, and this confusion led members of Team Theorist and the Game Theory channel to speculate that they could have been pieces of a puzzle or an ARG that was just never finished. Not only did the short story titled Felix the Shark contain plot points revolving around clues that are intentionally hidden inside a fictional novel, but another story titled The Scoop also referenced a real-life location where a character finds a picture hidden in the files of a FNAF 3 mobile port. These plot elements likely contributed heavily to the confusion surrounding whether Fazbear Frights 12 was related to an ARG, finished or otherwise. In order to find some more definitive answers, MadPat called on members of his audience to help him double check whether there was a deeper mystery tied to the locations referenced in Fazbear Frights 12. Game Theory released a video on June 5th, 2022, outlining details of the book, which stuck out to MadPat. In addition to a call to action, MadPat would later state that he had only intended for his audience members to do some digging into the files of the FNAF 3 mobile ports, and for some fans who were locals to the areas mentioned in Fazbear Frights 12 to maybe clue him in if Team Theorist had missed anything. The only problem is, there was no ARG. Unfortunately, in the hours following the release of the video, theorists attempting to crack the supposed mystery would go on to break one of the unwritten rules of ARG participation. Never call and ask real people, places, or businesses. Things quickly spiraled out of control as hundreds of calls from fans began flooding businesses in order to ask for video game lore. These calls were supposedly so frequent that one location even had to disconnect their phone. Seeing the shitstorm that was growing, MatPat reacted quickly by calling for a full stop on the FNAF ARG hunts, while reiterating that it's never okay to bother or harass any individual or place of business, whether you're playing an ARG or not. In his video apologizing for disruptions caused by this, MatPat gives a succinct explanation of how these calls can have quickly and cause a lot of issues, even if they aren't necessarily ill-intended. He acknowledges that his Felix the Shark video may have been the first exposure of ARGs for some of his audience members, and that the people making these calls were likely overenthusiastic rather than malicious. Finally, the rest of the video is used as a jumping off point in order to draft a list of ARG rules of etiquette that will hopefully be seen by those who interacted with the Felix the Shark video. Unfortunately, toes were stepped on because people wanted there to be an ARG. The clues and puzzle pieces of an ARG are supposed to be obvious, at least to a degree. Since there likely was no ARG to begin with, people who were expecting to eventually be put on the track of one if they dug deep enough only caused disruptions for real people instead. While MatPat states he had intended for people to interact with the clues he presented in a safe and responsible way, and to stick to investigating game files if they were not a local to one of these areas, the instructions he gave were actually much more vague and nebulous. I need you to help me either solve this thing once and for all, or debunk it. And who knows, maybe this is the push that we need to get the next major answer to the game's lore. That said, good on him for addressing the issue quickly. Ultimately, the takeaway here is, while ARGs do allow us to live out very unique fantasies of uncovering a buried mystery or stumbling on something forbidden and dark, if you aren't completely sure that you're on the intended track of one of these games, it's best to take a step back, whether you're a regular player or a content creator. Super Mario Beta Archive was an unfiction channel on YouTube which posted unreleased content from a fake beta version of Super Mario 64. The channel was run by two characters, 
Eric, a playtester from Argonaut Software, and Meg, a GUI developer. Eric and Meg claim to have gotten hold of cassettes, tapes, and project files from the Super Mario 64 beta never before seen by the public eye. The uploads range from pre-renders and unused music to gameplay and GUI demonstrations from the beta, though much of this content seems corrupted in odd ways. Beyond the footage being clearly old and damaged, a narrative starts to unfold surrounding an employee at Argonaut who seems to be encountering some kind of workplace harassment before they stumble stumble onto something supernatural, possibly involving drowning. This narrative, which was structured from the perspective of employees at Argonaut sending internal memos to one another, unfortunately went unresolved. While the ARG laid groundwork for an intriguing and immersive story through their high quality uploads, it ultimately fell apart due to poor management. On January 12, 2021, many of the unpaid workers who worked on Super Mario Beta Archive spoke out about toxicity, both on the investigation discord and at the project's highest levels. Emotional abuse, the encouragement of crunch from the creators, and the theft of work is only what we know for sure these volunteers had to put up with, though it's unlikely that we will have the full story as that can only be known by the individuals who were there as of the making of this video. Honestly, it's a real shame that the work of such talented volunteers was squandered on a project that everyone seems to agree was a complete mess. The gameplay footage, renders, and even the music were all produced with such a level of quality that it left many people genuinely convinced that the content was authentic, or at least well above the quality of a creepypasta. Unfortunately, it seems having all these project assets delivered for free just wasn't enough for the ARG's director, and when they started to get antsy about not uploading frequently enough, the burden fell back onto the unpaid volunteers. At least that's what the accounts of all these contributors who were left high and dry seem to suggest, including one unfortunate case where a user reported that their work was uploaded without permission as a retaliatory measure for leaving the project. This argument spawned from creative differences for how the creator treated its staff. Perhaps if there had been a little more respect for the time, energy, and effort of these talented volunteers, Super Mario Beta Archive could have been one of the ARGs that everybody was talking talking about. Meat Sleep is one of the most well-known, unsettling ARGs. The imagery alone was enough to captivate watchers while leaving many of us disturbed. Each short video felt like it was taking notes from old-school creepypasta, with the use of rustic locations, loud abrasive audio, all the while the unthinkable is implied. I love you be like a person. You live here. You are ungrateful. Meat Sleep was created March 28, 2014, with no new updates since April 30, 2016. Many videos in Sleep's catalog references the name Soonkin, which is an anagram for new skin, and from what we could gather, also the name the author used to go by when posting videos to 4chan, although many of this content is lost. The story, or at least what was there before it was abandoned, implies that there is a stalker that kills and potentially eats people. It that I noticed when reading the earliest saved comments is people who stumbled across this disturbing channel without context and believing that there's an actual cannibal serial killer posting videos about their crime taunting the viewer to solve their mystery. This will later lead to why Meat Sleep was never finished, but fans of this series range from those who appreciate the macabre art and ARG to people being outright hostile because it wasn't scary enough. To me, however, this ARG is something that's special to me for how it uses uniquely takes these disconnected film segments made by different people and recontextualizes them in a way that even knowing that it's fake makes me uncomfortable. Unfortunately, Meat Sleep never got past its early stages due to controversy and drama. My first hint of this was when I found this weird comment talking about a GoFundMe. Turns out, Meat had featured a YouTube channel ran by some woman trying to get help with their sick puppy through GoFundMe, a popular theory being that Meat and this woman were the same person. This is in fact not true. I'm not entirely sure how many people worked on Meat Sleep, but from what we could gather, there were about 11 team members on this project, with this woman likely having absolutely nothing to do with it. 
all the negativity and the growing number of people trying to find Meat's true identity, while also not realizing that this is all a game, started to become a problem. This culminated in a video titled No More, which further explained the situation in the typical Meat Sleep way. However, it was thanks to this video that we got more clarification on what exactly Meat Sleep was. It was a cool art social experiment created by a team of individuals who made decisions about the narrative and story entirely based on fan interactions and dice rolls. It would have been so cool if it was able to complete and finish, but unfortunately it ended due to controversy. From what I could find online, there were many people or a few people making videos specifically targeting Meat and the development team, and there was even one video that even claimed to have a dox on one of the developers. But from what I could tell, in that video, it doesn't reference any of the people behind the project, at least none of the people that I could find publicly named, which leads me to believe that there's a video out on YouTube right now that's just a crazy person harassing someone outside of Meat Sleep because of Meat Sleep. It's easy to now understand why that this ARG ended with a simple message. Sad to say, a fun thing made to be fun and enjoyed. Sad to say you made it ugly. Please stop bothering these people about this channel. For the victims of the harassment, we are sorry. You did not deserve these. We did not intend these. All of you, please stop. You ruined things. Enough. This is over. Stop. Between the years 1982 and 1983, a series of games were released for the Atari 2600, unlike anything the gaming world had ever seen before. Sword Quest was a title that promised to bring the fantasy of a grand treasure hunt into the real world. It offered lucrative prizes to adventurers who solved the mysteries hidden within each game and outcompeted their fellow players at Atari headquarters. These games had real-world stakes, and the prizes themselves were nothing to scoff at. Adorned with precious stones and minted in gold, platinum, and white jade, the Sword Quest prizes were created by the Franklin Mint Museum and valued at $25,000 each. These prizes included the Talisman of Pentultimate Truth, the Chalice of Light, the Crown of Life, and the Philosopher's Stone. The grand prize, however, which the previous four winners would compete for in the final challenge, was the Sword of Ultimate Sorcery valued at $50,000. Each Sword Quest game included a poster and comic book published by DC, which served to expand on the lore of the Sword Quest universe, as well as being integral to making sense of the clues within the game. These comics followed the twins, Terra and Tor, who pursue a prophecy of revenge revealed to them by the wizard Conjuro in order to avenge the deaths of their parents at the hands of the evil King Tyrannus. I don't know if there's anything on this planet more 80s in power metal than that. Each game is played by navigating from chamber to chamber, avoiding traps, and completing many games in order to locate hidden treasure. By collecting the treasure in the rooms and depositing them in specific areas, the player was awarded clues to aid them in the Sword Quest contest. By getting these clues and cross-referencing against the comic book, players would find a passphrase that would be mailed to Atari, with some missing their chance due to red herrings in the puzzle. And qualifying players raced with one another to complete a specifically programmed challenge edition of the game, and whoever reached the end first was declared the winner of that game's prize. After financial setbacks due to the video game crash and an insider trading scandal, Atari found itself under new management in 1983, which cut both the contest for Waterworld and the partially developed Airworld game. 
Participants who qualified for the Water World Contest were awarded compensatory checks of $2,000, and the two finalists who won the Earth World and Fire World Contests were awarded checks for $15,000. While it doesn't quite make up for the missed chance at glory, it's nice to know that these contestants didn't have to walk away empty-handed. Prototypes of the unreleased Air World game have been both rumored and hoaxed in the past. However, Atari has recently announced that the Digital Eclipse team has created this fourth and final entry to the Sword Quest series as a part of the Atari 50th Anniversary Celebration Collection. This leaves one loose end, however, the fate of those illustrious prizes. Thanks to this interview with the winner of the Fire World Contest, we know that the talisman of Pentultimate Truth was smelted by the first Sword Quest contest winner, Stephen Bell, who sold the gold for $15,000 while keeping a small sword that adorned the talisman as a memento. Fireworld's winner, Michael Rideau, still holds the Chalice of Light in a bank for safekeeping, intending to pass it down through the generations as a family heirloom like the Knights of Old. Since only these two prizes were ever awarded, the crown the Philosopher's Stone and the sword had become the subject of speculation and urban legend. One rumor was started by an, an Atari employee claimed to have spotted the sword of ultimate sorcery mounted on the fireplace of the man who purchased Atari back in 1983, Jack Trammell. You purchase Atari and you become king all in the same day? It stands to reason, however, that if Jack kept the sword he likely has the other prizes as well. This is disputed by Atari historian Kurt Vendel, who points out that Atari never owned the prizes themselves, making it more likely that the sword above Tramiel's fireplace was not the Sword Quest sword, and that the prizes were retained by Franklin Mint and eventually smelted back down. While we can't prove either of these theories conclusively, the mystery surrounding these prizes makes them all the more legendary. Between the years 2012 to 2014, a series of puzzles were posted to the B board of 4chan by an anonymous poster calling themselves 3301. These puzzles each began with an image containing a message explaining that 3301 was looking for, quote, highly intelligent individuals and had created a test to find them. Users were challenged to find the hidden clues in a series of cryptography-based puzzles and follow them to the end. The puzzles themselves were very elaborate, with well-hidden ciphers that often required additional decryption before pointing to the next step. An image would point to a webpage, which would point to a book, which would then point to a subreddit, and so on. Each clue also contained a verification code called a PGP signature, which is difficult to replicate, preventing imposters from pretending to be 3301 in order to derail or hijack the puzzles. Before long, a community of participants began to come together in order to unravel the clues, and to theorize who or what was waiting at the end of the puzzles. Rumors began to circulate, with many dismissing the challenge as an elaborate troll early on. Others also theorized that 3301 was intended as an ARG marketing campaign to promote some kind of product or service. The puzzle seemed professionally produced enough for this to be the case, but there was no product to be found. Lacking answers, some even began to speculate that the group was recruiting individuals for some kind of secret society or intelligence agency. The puzzles eventually reached a point where only a set number of participants were allowed to advance to the final, private stages. Collaboration and sharing of information from these parts of the tests were highly discouraged, although confirming that is something that is also impossible. Leaked information from an unconfirmed finalist of the first puzzles includes an email from Cicada3301 describing themselves as an international group that believed privacy to be an inalienable right. The email also outlined the purpose of the puzzles, to recruit like-minded individuals who would help the group in their efforts to develop privacy-conscious solutions. 
This email is difficult to verify, however, since it lacks the PGP signature, which was included in all of the official announcements and clues. Nearly a month after their first post, 3301 announced the conclusion of the first puzzle, claiming to have found the individuals they were looking for. A second and third round of puzzles would eventually follow, unfolding in a similar way, with each clue needing to be deciphered before it pointed to another. It's difficult to tell who is and isn't a legitimate finalist. But Rolling Stones magazine supposedly interviewed two individuals who reached the final stages and were contacted by Cicada 3301. They claim Cicada 3301 had been founded by a group of friends who worked together to develop software and applications in line with their ideals, increase privacy, and free access to information. In retrospect, it seems likely that Cicada is a group of hobbyists rather than a worldwide organization or even an ARG. The group's stated ideals have been compared to niche movements like crypto anarchism and cypherpunk. These movements advocate for the widespread use of cryptography to increase privacy and enact social change. Despite what we know now, Cicada 3301 had a very different reputation at the time, and this public perception was fueled by a number of controversies tied to the group. In 2012, a hacker by the name of Enzo Alexander, also known as Necrome, was arrested in Chile for using fake bank web pages to fraudulently obtain people's banking information. Authorities claimed that the scam was being carried out by the hacker group Cicada 3301, though Cicada denied any involvement in illegal activity or with Necrome. Accusations tying the group to illegal hacking activity didn't end there, as in 2015, a cyber attack was carried out against Planned Parenthood by a group of pro-life hackers who released databases and employee information. Thankfully, it seems the personal information of patients was not compromised. On the website featuring the database dump, the hacker group, which calls themselves 3301, tried to promote their political message. In response, the real Cicada also denied association with this group, even going as far as to say that they do not condone the hacker group's use of their name, number, or symbolism. Tribe 12 is, or was, a popular Slender ARG series created by Adam Rosner. It coincided with Marble Hornets, Everyman Hybrid, Dark Harvest, and M.L. Anderson, all known as the Big Five. Tribe 12 was the second most popular Slender ARG series, and there is an emphasis on was. The series itself was very well received for a reason. Well, many reasons, because it was very, very well made. While the beginning of the series wasn't that great, it got so much better as time went on. It's one of those examples of, well, maybe you didn't have that great of a start, but you learn how to work with your stuff the more you work on it. The acting gets better, the VFX work gets better, the editing gets better, the writing is stellar. It's very impressive. Unfortunately, you know the title of this video and something horrible goes wrong. Because I feel as if it's important for me to clarify, Adam Rosner has not been proven guilty to anything I am going to discuss in accordance with the law. On September the 5th, 2020, Adam Rosner began to be accused by one and then multiple people with several instances of child sexual with minors, fetishization of minors, and sexual assault. The start of the allegations kicked off when this user, Eve, posted this. Alright guys, I don't know who can see this, but I've made the decision to finally speak about it. When I was 15, my favorite YouTuber attempted to I've had trust issues over the years due to this, and it just messed with the way I perceive YouTubers in general. I know I'm going to be inviting all sorts of trouble talking about this, but it needs to be said, this man is still popular with a big audience of children, I've been afraid to speak out for years, and for a long time considered just ignoring it. Later in the thread, it is clarified that Eve is referring to Adam Rosner specifically. The thread then led to another Twitter post and then dumping conversations between Eve and Adam. These conversations displayed a rather disturbing pattern of behavior from trying to meet up with this at the time, a 15-year-old girl, and in general just being an absolute creep. After these logs were dropped, a number of other people also came out with their own statements, which you can see in this Reddit compilation thread that will be linked in the description. In terms of Adam's response, he didn't give much of one at all. There was this response on Discord reading, Right now, I'm being attacked by some ex-Tribe 12 fans who have been trying to cancel me for months. It's not true. I have the evidence against it. I got rid of my social media because I've been sick of it anyway, and I'm not going to take harassment every day from a cancellation attempt. Another response was one that came from his Tumblr. They're making it out like because I have a little cis that I prey on younger aged people and am a 
This is not true, I never cared about age to begin with, and I'm not attracted to minors. It's personal theoretical fantasy that I never actually act on or pursue in real life. I admit to have been flirty and sexual with several people online over the past few years. If they were minors, I was unbeknownst because I check profiles for information and made sure they were of age, but it was always mutual, consensual, and not of malicious intent. I always asked before anything, there was no pressuring or predatory action, although I also admit to talking to more than one person a few times. Way more than I should have, it helped boost my self-esteem in a dark time, but since then it's been really grating on my conscience and I regret doing it. I was younger and didn't think things through, I didn't intend to hurt or harm or offend anyone. I apologize for being flirty and sexual with multiple people over the course of the past few years, especially if they were actually minors and I didn't know, and I apologize to all of the Patreon. But what's weird about this statement is that Adam claims that he didn't know that the people he spoke to were minors. However, when you look back at the logs with Eve, he clearly knows that Eve is a minor, which is, uh... That's a little bit inconsistent. Now, Adam claimed that he was going to respond to all of the allegations, and that response never came. According to this individual who was a part of the Tribe 12 Discord and personally knew Adam, this person revealed quite the amount of information. To add insult to injury, the Discord moderation team were told as a whole that he would be putting the allegations to rest with concrete evidence to the contrary. It never came, he dropped from the face of the earth, deleted several personal social media accounts, and blocked anyone in my immediate circle that had a chance at getting in contact with him. It's a miracle that people were able to get a hold of him at all. There was one thing though that came out of Adam, which was a leaked phone call. The phone call is full of interesting tidbits of Adam defending himself for certain things that he supposedly did. However, while he doesn't directly admit to everything outright, he has a habit of indirectly discussing how there are things that he did that were bad and talking about how he wasn't in a good place back then, but there is one particular part of this that I find to be a little bit bad. Just, just a little bit. That was messed up back then. And that's not an excuse. Autism's not an excuse, it's not a crutch. It's not an excuse, but it's a reason. And I didn't understand what was going on with my head and what I was doing. Yeah, I'm sure everybody that is watching this video right now loves it when somebody uses their autism as an excuse. As far as I'm concerned, there has been no further statements from Adam, and there probably won't be any more. Either way, Tribe 12 itself was an amazing series, it just sucks that it had to be cancelled because of Adam Rosner's actions. Rest in peace, Tribe 12. <laughs>
you already know. Most assumed that behind the meme would be unfazed by the criticism, since his revenue bottom line was unaffected by these admittedly mean-spirited jabs. The bitter tone of his response video caused others to realize that the negative attention was actually affecting Kyle, which, in addition to this video by Emp Lemon, fed into a campaign of hatred that quickly got out of hand. Following attempts to paint behind the meme as a laughing stock by baiting him into covering a meme that didn't actually exist, the harassment extended to the real world, with Kyle's grandma and uncle both being doxxed. Presumably having had enough, behind the meme began to slow down their upload frequency before going on hiatus for a period of five months in 2018. If his story ended here, this would probably paint Kyle in a more sympathetic light. Just some goober lacking self-awareness who wanted to make stupid videos about memes. When Behind the Meme returned to YouTube, it was with a foreboding and cryptic series of videos in an ARG style that seemed to be documenting the declining mental health of a content creator pushed over the edge. The tone of these videos was much more dark and serious, portraying behind the meme as a reckless, unrepentant alcoholic who had become jaded by the constant hate he had been receiving. The videos also seemed to suggest that Kyle had a death wish, showing him implied drunk driving and blaming the internet backlash for his self-destructive behavior. Many viewers became genuinely afraid that Kyle was in danger and tried to reach out and offer support in the comments before he did something more rash. The series culminated in a video that would be removed from YouTube titled 5 The End, which appeared to show Kyle unconvincingly game-overing himself. In this stunt, Kyle simulates the act, then plays a stock shooting sound effect before cutting the video. While he would later try to defend these actions by claiming that the series was intended to raise awareness on its subject matter, others quickly saw through this damage control for the tasteless, manipulative narrative Kyle had spun. We don't need to explain why making people in real life worry about your safety is a bad idea especially considering how many people didn't take Etika seriously. In his attempt to turn the hate he had received for all those years back onto his perceived bullies, attackers, and trolls, behind the meme effectively alienated anyone who still cared enough about him to offer their support when he seemed to be at his lowest. Cave of Shadows began August 12, 2015 with the introductory video called Welcome to Cave of Shadows. The story follows an American YouTuber named Elias Doyle in his attempts to investigate and fight the mysterious organization known as The System that seems to have been watching Elias since childhood. Be warned that early content is very low quality, often using MS Paint and edited mixed media horror assets. One thing that I can definitely say that I do like about Cave of Shadows though, is that it's one of the earlier or earliest examples of analog horror, that series like Local 58, Chippy Champa, and the Mandela catalogs popularize later on. The story is relayed to the viewer often through public access-like broadcasts that contain an excessive amount of base 64, hexadecimal, and binary ciphers, which can get frustrating when you have to manually type out long strings of text into a decoder. This got so bad, in fact, that it made scare theaters swear off ARGs entirely. The next video- <sighs> Alright guys, I can't do this. Alright, please don't cut my balls off for this, but I have a confession to make. I really lost interest in this whole ARG after watching Elias Doyle's unboxing, and I'm finding this whole awake analysis to be really boring and non-motivating. I don't know if you've noticed, but literally every video on this channel is pretty much the same. They all just have some cryptic text on the screen in base 64 or hexadecimal, and in every video they almost always translate to exactly the same thing they did in the previous video. I liked this ARG at the beginning, but now I'm not so sure. 
So yeah, this is the last video I'm making about the system, and I probably won't cover ARGs too much anymore either. Despite the frustration of actually following this and the less visually appealing aspects, I really do see what Cave of Shadows is going for. It's just an ambitious project that seems to be started by people who were rather young at the time. And I see this thing. This thing right here. I see a thing everywhere. I don't, I don't even know. What does that look like to you, huh? What does someone make of this? That context is necessary when talking about Cave of Shadows as a creative work. It's not only hard to assign blame where missteps may have been taken, but one of the guys is basically wiped off the internet. Sure, if an adult made this in 2022, there'd be some serious issues, which we'll get into later. But as a labor of love produced by people who might still be in high school, wow, this is actually pretty damn creative. And if your suspension of disbelief can handle a kid live tweeting his progress running away from a shadowy organization, then I can see how people got into this one. It's also worth noting that Scare Theater's video on Cave of Shadows and its sister channels, The Zombie and Awake, gained over 1.8 million views, with people in the comments section often expressing how much they loved this project at the time. At least, that's how it started. Some problems really do creep up, and it's definitely worth discussing for everyone else who's trying to make their own unfiction projects. Cave of Shadows spans across several YouTube channels with their own independent creators, a blog, and a few Twitter accounts. A while back, the Awake channel was hacked and is no longer on YouTube, and outside of two videos, the Nisambi account had its entire catalog scrubbed. The controversy first started when the Cave of Shadows team tried to request coverage of their work, both from Nightmind and Scare Theater. This move directly led to Nightmind's rule on requesting coverage. Not a great thing to forever have your legacy tied to. The story also uncomfortably focused on drawing parallels to a real-life disappearance and possible kidnapping of a child named Michael Dunahy, even going as far as using home videos taken shortly before he vanished. The main character felt a kinship with him, but also might be implying that the real-life murderer, the pig farmer killer, might have something to do with it. This coupled with gross illusions to non-consensual acts of younger people. Don't you agree? Especially Penguin's favorite was long after the game ended. He took him into the little boy's room and helped him. Kinda turned people way the hell off. Ignoring the obvious disrespect to the victim's family, I want to read a little bit of this now deleted comment on the subject, which was made by Nisambi. The system was my first real venture into making content in a genre that I have been passionate about ever since I was little. To say that I have been jaded from working on the project would be an understatement. We made many mistakes and paid some pretty extreme prices, but at least now I can say we all came out better on the other side. My only regrets now are how I sometimes Sometimes behave so immaturely towards others back then. Since the mishap relating to asking for direct coverage from Nick came about, nobody really cared. I made myself and my friend's passion project the ground zero for why Nick now has the rule of never directly asking for coverage. We made peace with him, and that's fine. Lessons learned. I also regret the inclusion of any references to Michael Dunahy. Bringing him into this wasn't my decision to make. It wasn't fair to his family even if my intentions weren't as sinister as they appeared. The way that I look at it, Cave of Shadows was pretty cool. It was just a bunch of friends trying to do their best and their hardest to make something that in the end was executed poorly and made many mistakes along the way. I'm glad to hear that the creators learned from their mistakes and have been making better content. For example, Elias is also known as Elliot and has been making the Sun is Vanished ARG, which from what I can tell is actually pretty cool. The people that made this project are now adults, both making their own independent works that are now much better received thanks to the mistakes that they learned from and made along the way. Who hasn't done something stupid as a team? Most of us, though, are fortunate enough not to be in front of a camera when that happens. Before you click off the video, I would like to update you on why I haven't been around for the last three months. 
it's a combination of YouTube burnout because, you know, I've been doing this whole YouTube thing consistently since I was about 14 years old. And even before then, I was like writing and helping other YouTube channels to being forced to move because the landlord raised the rent to a price that just didn't really make sense for us. So we've been trying to find a absolutely perfect location to move to and luckily we have. About a week after this video is uploaded, hopefully I won't be in this place anymore and I'll be in some place where I'll, you know, be able to save some money. I'm gonna have to say goodbye to some friends, I'm moving the farthest away from my, you know, parents house than I ever have before, and all this stuff is new, scary, and hard to understand. And I guess the stress from all that really made the burnout kind of come out. And even though I've been in this kind of terrible mood, I've been working on multiple projects at a time, and as a result, I'm hoping to God that I can get another video out in December, and another one either next month or the month after. I've been just exhausted, and I'm hoping that moving and having a better place to live will help remedy some of those issues. None of this would have been possible at all if it wasn't for the patrons helping me keep afloat while I wasn't uploading content and trying to figure out my whole housing situation. Thankfully, I had some amazing friends that I would like to shout out right now that helped me with the production of this video. The first is The Right Opinion, who helped me get footage for Behind a Meme. A lot of this stuff isn't like archived anymore and you can't really find it on the internet very easily and he helped me out quite a bit there. The second is LS Mark who as you know is the FNAF guy on YouTube and he helped me out with a lot of footage including lending me his hand so that I may use it to showcase book. And as you know, I also get help from an editor, his name is Chris Lotus, and he absolutely came through with me on this. We worked together and I think we made the best video we possibly could given the circumstances. I also really appreciate your friendly gamer who kinda came in at the last minute and helped me do some cleanup work after my program was giving me some issues. I guess the thing I kind of want to impart is that a lot of the most amazing things in my life happened because people came together and we just helped each other. I had a lot of help with this video and I am so appreciative for everyone who came in. George doing the lines, NDL Mongoose coming back from the grave, and the narrator for the Tribe 12 segment is actually a good friend of mine that I met at BronyCon, the very last one where we so happened to run into Chris Chan, and here's my excuse to show that picture. That was a magical event that I need to talk about at a later date. Uh, Serafina also makes their own videos, and I'm gonna have them in the end card right here. They made a great video about a, another content creator that we'll probably be discussing on Worst YouTubers. I'll link their video in the end card, which is conveniently right now. Um, it's been a long day, probably gonna play some Dark Tide, and I hope to see you guys for the next one. Disturbing anime moments.